All right, welcome to Mini Unfridging Number 2, where we unpack all kinds of stuff. This episode isn't going to be a pure unboxing video, though. Right now, my quote-unquote studio is just a small space in a rec room, and yeah, we just don't have much freedom of movement at the moment. Since we're at it, I'm pleased to say we now have not one, but two cameras. Yep, we can finally do two-angle shooting thanks to an early upgrade by my cell provider. Which is great, because sometimes cameras... go AWOL. Also, I've finally got my hands on one of those little gimbal things. Having a gimbal provides nice, steady video when you're kind of panning around and trying to show stuff. Of course, I did try steady shooting with just my own hands, but yeah, a lot of people were complaining about seasickness. Anyway, it seems like our long international nightmare may be over, so here's looking forward to what comes next. Speaking of what comes next, here's a few bits I've reclaimed from my box down in Florida. You'll be seeing each of these next in another video. Anyway, sit tight and enjoy Mini Unfridging number two. Okay, so first up we have this lovely Hammond case with the remnants of something or other inside. Hammond was and still is a very skilled maker of electronics equipment cases, and this form factor with the wood sides very much remind me of one of my favorite computers, the OSI Challenger Model 4P. I first saw this case used to house an Apple II clone and thought, wow, that looks awesome. I forget what that unit sold for, but it was several hundred dollars at least. I scored this one for not too much as nobody seemed to know what it was, and the seller thought it was a word processor. I'm hoping to use it as a home for one of my currently caseless computers. Anyway, let's check it out. I mean, it's really nice. The wood is nice quality. Hammond does a really nice job on these. And there's all kinds of different form factors. There's just like plain cabinets, which I've seen some S100 gear in. Uh, there's more of this classic wedge shape. But yeah. And I think they only made the, the chassis or case. I don't think they had anything to do with the keyboards, electronics, or anything else. So this one's kind of interesting because you've got this LCD screen here, uh, but you've also got a row of LEDs across the front and I don't know exactly how that would have been used back in the day. Uh, the keyboard is really nice. Uh, it's got a nice soft touch. It almost types like a de novo. Like it's really, uh, really nice to type on. Definitely feels modern-ish. Uh, and then inside, you can lift off the top like that. And this is where it starts getting weird. <laughs> so we've got a printer in there a dot matrix printer and it is bolted in there that's where they intended to have it i don't know why you would do that because there's nowhere for the paper to exit but uh whatever it also came with a spare printer which i don't know what i would use it for but it's brand new it's like a little dot matrixy thing it's quite stuck in the box it's the yeah i mean that's practically brand new Basically, a seat printer mechanism. That's kind of what I think it is. It's like a disemboweled receipt printer that's been modified and thrown into that other chassis. I don't know how that fit in there before. Anyway, uh, and then we've got our power cord there. And then these are the boards. And I really don't know, I'm pretty sure they're all to do with the printer and the torque converter and some other thing here. So yeah, and you got your power supply, you got your fan. Um, yeah, and then if we lift this piece off, so you can see we've got our LCD screen there, keyboard, and that's the back side. So the keyboard date looks like it is 42nd week of 86, so almost 1987. So that's why it's so modern feeling. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Actually, if you look on the right about there, it's kind of hard to see. You can see the marks they made when they were drilling this out. So yeah, so whoever built this, bought this chassis from uh, Hammond and then basically modified it to their own specifications. And then this is where I think there may have been a computer of some sort before because we've got holes drilled in the bottom at various points and we've got this big edge connector which appears to be attached to the power supply and I would think anything requiring 
this much power would tend to be some sort of computer, computery thing. Uh, we've got some wires that are cut off here that are going to this uh, board, which is, I believe, the printer control board. And then this is the LED panel that just kind of slides out like that. And yeah, it looks like one, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve or thirteen digits worth. So yeah, I don't know. I have no idea what this would be for, but it's really cool. And I just love the case. And I thought, you know, I need to have that. So originally what I was thinking was I got this Ferguson big board too. And I was thinking, you know, I would love to find a case for that. It originally had a case, but the original owner was having trouble selling it because it was this huge steel thing. So he actually threw out the case and the keyboard, which kind of sucks, but he saved the board and I got it for pretty much a song. But yeah, it looks like if I were to remove these two boards, this would pretty much fit right underneath the keyboard. So I could probably build an interface for that. Um, I'm sure the keyboard's probably a standard parallel ASCII keyboard or maybe serial, and I'm pretty sure the Ferguson board can accommodate both. And then, yeah, um, if that power supply is any good, we could potentially use that for power. I don't know if I would keep the printer. <laughs> it's kind of, a, I don't know. That's kind of a weird place to have a printer. Like, I guess you'd have to run it with the top off. I would love to find some application that could potentially incorporate the use of the uh, LEDs there, as well as this LCD display. I don't know what resolution that is, but it might be usable for something. So yeah, that's our first item. Looks really awesome. Really, really happy with it. And yeah, we'll move on to the next thing. Our next arrival will probably only interest hardcore Apple II guys like myself. These are a set of uncommon combination memory jumpers for the Apple II. The original Apple II could be outfitted with as little as 4 kilobytes of memory, a nod to the crazy expensive RAM prices of the day. However, if you change the jumpers on the board, you could upgrade your machine all the way up to 48K. The jumpers just tell the machine which type of RAM is installed in each bank. What's unusual about these jumpers is that they allow for one row of 16K and then two rows of 4K for a total of 24K. I've heard the rarest of these jumpers is the pure 4K version, but I'm not sure that they're actually marked like these to indicate being 4K or if they're just the hand-wired ones we often see in early prototypes. Anyway, glad I have these and will definitely see if I can boost my Rev Zero machine to 24K just for kicks. In April of 1974, Don Lancaster, the inventor of the TV typewriter, heard the pleas of hobbyists and teamed up with Popular Electronics and Southwest Technical Products of San Antonio to bring out what may well be the first general purpose ASCII keyboard aimed at the home market. The keyboard was published as a project article in the April 1974 edition of Popular Electronics. It was quite compact and rudimentary, but it included a built-in ASCII encoder and cost just 40 bucks or so to build. A bargain. Southwest would ultimately take over the design and improve on it right up to the KVD-5, but the KVD-1 is the Don Lancaster original and it's by far the rarest of the bunch. I've been trying for years to get my hands on one, but they're ridiculously expensive today, partly owing to their association with Apple, as one of the keyboards some Apple One users employed for their computers. Popular Electronics published the details in the magazine and, like Radio Electronics with the TV typewriter, also offered a construction guide you could request by mail. If you were too cheap or, you know, broke to pay the 17 bucks for the Southwest keyboard PCB, you could etch your own with these plans in the back. However, if you're willing to stump up a bit, Southwest would send you this nice box with everything you needed to build your own affordable keyboard. And yep, there is a genuine KBD one in here. I finally got one. This one is built, but it came with the box and original documentation, which is fantastic. Let's see here. There's an envelope with the original builder's name on it. <laughs> damaged in handling, back when the post office actually cared enough to let you know. Ah, and here's another copy of the construction guide. Looks like Southwest added some notes on the backside. And this is the parts layout sheet. Ah, and there it is. Wow. This thing is so primitive and small. It's quite a bit smaller than this later KBD-5 I have, and the PCB feels a bit thinner too. And the keys are kind of jiggly. <laughs> yeah, the key switches on these were pretty cheap and simple. Lots of compromises had to be made to make this thing economic for the average Joe. Wow, 
Like I said, I've always wanted one of these, but I've never been able to buy one. I've only ever seen two or three in my lifetime, and they're usually tethered to a TV typewriter or something else that's way more expensive. Yeah, these will retail for 600 or more all by themselves, and that's driven in part by that association with Apple. If you have a vintage computer from 1977 or prior, this is a perfectly authentic keyboard for it. This is history right here in my hands. Nice. Next up, a monitor. This is a Casper RGB monitor that is EGA compatible. It's kind of hard to believe when you're over a certain age, but these things are getting really, really rare these days, especially in working condition. This one came with a machine that I'll be showing you in a moment. It appears to have been very well packed and survived the trek okay, but yeah, darn. It's looking like we've got some cracks on the bottom here, and yeah, the teeth that hold the pedestal to the bottom of the monitor also appear to have been mostly snapped off. That's not a good sign. Well, let's set it up with our Tandy 1000 here, and uh, yeah, we'll just see what happens. Ah, well, that's disappointing. What is that? I've never seen a dark spot like that. What the? And it, it kind of goes away when you tap on it. That's just bizarre. All right, I've never seen anything like that, but uh, we'll come back to this later. Ah, yes, the IBM PS2 Model 70. When I was a kid, we had two PS2 Model 30s. One we had for all of a month or two until I complained about the lack of a five and a quarter inch disc drive for my games. That was a big mistake. Dad traded it for an IBM AT with four color CGA graphics. <laughs> anyway, we eventually got another one years later, and I always kind of liked the design and the unique sounds it made. And of course, not having four color graphics anymore was kind of nice. I had seen advertisements for the more powerful PS2s and had always found them kind of interesting. I just love the IBM industrial design and I particularly love the way the PS2 Model 50 and 70 kind of look like a PS2 Model 30 that's just been kind of stretched out. So yeah, I always wanted to play with one but didn't get the chance until I scored this one for, well, almost nothing actually. Yeah, I love that industrial design. We will definitely try firing this up one day for sure. Now this one seems to pass the smell test. You know what, let's just see if it'll pass the smoke test. Yeah, so far so good. Anyway, we'll fire it up for fun in some future video. Ah, I'm excited about this one. This is a very, very rare modular advanced design or MAD1 monitor. It's monochrome that's powered off of a 9 volt DC adapter and it goes with the ultra rare MAD1 computer. The MAD1 was sort of the obverse of the mindset. It used the same largely incompatible 8186 CPU and had the system divided into two stackable units with the computer on the bottom and the floppy drives up top. However, the MAD1 was mostly black to the Mindset's white, and unlike the Mindset was not designed with a heavy emphasis on graphics performance. Otherwise, just like the Mindset, it got tripped up by the 186's compatibility issues with the bulk of PC software. Today these are an incredibly rare find. Mad. God, I just can't get the grin off my face when I say that. They even had their own software for it, including a spreadsheet called, wait, are you waiting for this? Mad Plan. Can you imagine? <laughs> Excellent. With this Mad One computer, I can, wait a minute. You idiots. Where's the drive unit? The drive unit has the power supply. Without the power supply, I can't start Mad Plan and get rid of Brad H. You missed it. It's right in the middle. Hold up, hold up. So, you stole the screen from on top of the drive unit. And then you stole the computer from under the drive unit. But you forgot the middle part. Where is it? Okay, okay, you see this? This pen is a Mad One monitor, and your paycheck is a Mad One computer, and my signature is a Mad One drive unit. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm gonna forget the middle part! Get the hell out of my office! Yeah, you call your union rep. Next time we outsource, Mad Rat. Next time! <laughs> anyway, I'm not sure how far the Mad One got. I think it got even less traction than the Mindset, which is saying something. 
The hardware compatibility issue is inherent with the 186 and the general weirdness of the design probably didn't help, although it did get some screen time as a distraction device in the movie. I got my Mad One system unit from the estate sale of a famous hardware designer a while back. Unfortunately, the power supply is kept as a separate unit with the disk drives, which the seller didn't have, so I can't turn it on. The keyboard is also missing. A treasure hunter doing a dive at Computer Reset found one of these and let a bunch of us know. I immediately reached out to him to see if there had been any others there, and he thought there might be one more. Now, being up in British Columbia, I couldn't get down to Texas, but a very nice fellow I met in the Computer Reset buy and sell group named David volunteered to search out the unit for me, and if it was found, ship it out. Sure enough, it was found, minus the external 9 volt power supply. I was absolutely thrilled, of course, and even more so because David was willing to go out of his way and ship the thing for me. And he packed this thing to the nines, not a scratch on it. Wow. Yeah, this monitor is monochrome and it's fairly high resolution, but it's actually quite small and lightweight. And together with its computer, it just looks awesome. I'm trying to find the power button here, but uh, I don't know about this power button though. It feels like it's kind of, I think it should stick in more there. Let's oh, oh. What is that? Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> so it's basically an adjuster for angle. That is cool. So yeah, that's not the power button. I wonder where the power button is. Well, there you have it. To anyone trawling estate sales, computer reset, or what have you, if you see the other pieces for this machine, definitely shoot me an email. I would love to get this thing going, and I'm more than willing to pay for shipping and time involved to get these things out here. Some longer term followers of this channel might remember a video I did on unbuilt computer kits, and they might remember me talking about a very rare computer powered by the Signetix 2650 CPU. It was called the Central Data 2650, and it was available to hobbyists as a kit PCB and three proms. It was a project that was first introduced in Radio Electronics, and you had to build it yourself, but if you did, you had a decent little computer for personal use. Anyway, I scored an unbuilt kit for next to nothing a while back, and had been debating building it as I'd never seen a computer that uses the 2650 before. Well, the eBay gods smiled upon me, and now I have this. And... I guess what this is... Two doors. This one and this one. So obviously this is the computer and then this is uh, an expansion board. And I've actually seen pictures of a fully kitted out system with this expansion board. I never thought I'd see the board, let alone that. So yeah, I jumped all over that and the price wasn't too bad. I think it was a couple hundred bucks US or something like that or less. So yeah, I thought that was really decent. And I mean, it looks pretty close to pristine. Like it almost looks like it was never used. So yeah, that's kind of nice. It uh, definitely would relieve me of the need to uh, build an unbuilt kit. Now I can have sort of both versions to show off sort of a before and after type deal. There's our 2650. And going by the date code, it looks like probably it was built sometime in 1978. And then this is basically an S100 expansion slot system. You've got five slots on there. And it looks like it also has a video output port. And then you've got these empty sockets on both boards, which I assume are sort of interconnects between the two boards. So you need like a ribbon cable that goes between both. And yeah, now I haven't been able to find any information on how this connects, you know, which pins go where and uh, how these all connect over to the other side. I'm still looking for it. Like I said, I followed the article from the original one uh, two or three months down and then it disappeared. So I'm thinking this may not have shown up as a project or it may have shown up all, you know, ways later in a different issue several months down the line. So I kind of got to go and search through the rest of 1977, 1978 and see if I can come across it. And then if I can find that, then hopefully I can find more information on how to connect these two and kind of get them running. 
But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking what I'll probably do maybe is just do up like a nice custom wood case and then borrow one of my spare ASCII keyboards and, and basically just set it up as a late 1970s home computer. I think that'd be kind of cool. But yeah, it's, uh, it's really a nice shape. Somebody took care of it. That uh, saves me from the moral dilemma of having to uh, build an unbuilt vintage original. And uh, yeah, hopefully this one still works and we can kind of look forward to seeing that operate uh, someday in the not too distant future. Okay, for this next piece, a couple of videos ago I talked about a partial, partially built Rev Zero Altair kit that I scored from yet another estate sale. It had some main bits like the front panel, CPU board, case cover, manual, and so on. But it was missing a whole bunch of other stuff and especially a crucial piece that you needed to put the thing together, the chassis. The blue and gray case that I got with the kit pieces it was actually just the outer cover. There's actually an internal metal chassis that the whole computer bolts onto, power supply and everything. I didn't have that and finding one was probably going to be a nightmare. I've only ever seen one empty Altair chassis come up, like, ever. So that kind of put me in a bind. I happen to have a friend with a sophisticated metal fab shop and he offered to help recreate the internal chassis for me so that was a possibility. And that would have worked fine except we needed an original to measure off of. Now I don't know where you live but where I live Altairs are not common at all and even if there was around I don't think anyone would be eager to let me tear it apart to get measurements. Now, not all Altairs are as valuable as the original Rev Zero machine, so one option might be to purchase the least expensive model out there, which seems to be the 8800B Turnkey. The Turnkey is the least Altair-like of the bunch. MITS basically stripped it of its array of LEDs and switches, reducing the LEDs to just a few indicator lights and switches for basic power on and reset duty. However, the original chassis underneath remained pretty much unchanged and is fully interchangeable with the Rev Zero machine. So yeah, I could buy one of those, temporarily disassemble it and take measurements, or I could simply pilfer the chassis for my Rev Zero. But yeah, that kind of opens up a bit of a moral quandary for me. I don't like scrapping complete machines for parts, and I don't like taking apart vintage originals, even just temporarily, because I really prefer to preserve the original owner's work as much as possible. And anyway, the turnkey may be cheap relative to the Rev Zero, but it still fetches a thousand bucks pretty easily these days, so yeah, it's not dirt cheap. Anyway, a few weeks after shoving the Altair bits on a shelf and resigning myself to a long wait for parts, I get an email from a fellow named Theo in Australia. And Theo tells me he has exactly what I'm looking for, an Altair 8800B turnkey chassis, minus the cover and everything except the power supply and motherboard. I couldn't believe it, but he had the picks to back it up. So he offered to remove the power supply and motherboard and then disassemble the chassis to save dimensional costs with post and ship it over to me. But I decided to actually buy the whole thing. Why not? Sure, it's not quite correct for a Rev Zero, but it is authentic MITS gear, and I'd rather have stuff that isn't quite date code correct but original from the manufacturer than a replica any day. Anyway, let's unpack. And we will slice away the teeth and see what this is. I think there's probably much padding in this. I don't think it would need it. I think this machine is, I think this thing is much more likely to do damage to whatever it comes in contact with rather than any damage coming to it. Okay. Ooh, this is cool. I've been looking forward to this for a while now. Oh, look at that. That is awesome. Let's just uh, really tape this box down. Good job, Theo. I appreciate it. I really hate having to slash up the box, but I just don't see any way to... Oh, look at that. Wow. Okay, so first of all, what's this here? This is the fan from the back. Holy smokes, this thing is heavy. This thing is crazy heavy. It feels like it must be like three times the weight of a modern PC case fan. It's just huge. Uh, what else have we got here? I don't know what this is. Oh, that's just the... Uh, that's just the uh, fan cover. So we got there. 
Well, I've got something strapped in there. Nope, not strapped anymore. Oh yeah, these are the card guides. Yes. Yeah, he mentioned that he was going to disassemble these for me so that they wouldn't get uh, smashed in transit because they're getting pretty fragile now at 40 plus years of age. That is awesome. These must be the other ones on the other side here. Those are the other ones. Awesome. That is so fantastic. Okay, so now, how to open this in a way that doesn't come apart suddenly and cut my hands wide open. Let's, uh, we'll just cut down here. Go this way. Just see if I can gently lift it off. Oh, that's heavy. Oh, that power supply is just... Okay, let's just put that down there for a second. Knock my studio lights down. Yeah, this is why I don't do unboxings for the time being. It's just not enough room. Wow, look at that. That is cool. That is way cool. Let's pull these off. So yeah, that is the original internal chassis for an Altair 8800 B turnkey. And like I said, it is pretty well identical to the original. It's exactly the same metal work. Um, they did change the power supply, as I mentioned, because the original power supply stunk. It was absolutely terrible. So that might actually be a good thing. Theo said it wasn't working, so uh, I have to figure that out. And he did say something about it being converted to 240 volts for Australia. So uh, I might have to figure out, I'm definitely gonna have to figure out how to reverse that. Um, well, it's interesting, it's got a North American plug on it. And yeah, we have this enormous S100 backplane. I think that's original MITS. Um, the original Rev Zero only came with four slots, and then basically you added another four, another four, and you just kind of sistered them together. Now, the thing about the turnkey is they basically took away most of the front panel. They took away all the LED lights except for a couple of uh, power uh, and activity indicator lights. They got rid of the uh, switches except for the power and I think a reset switch. Uh, but for the internal chassis, they kept all the original drilled holes for the lights and switches. And I believe these holes line up with the Rev Zero. The 8800B, which is between the 8800 and 8800A, and then the uh, turnkey, um, it has the switches and lights just like the original, but it has a, a different front panel. It's been kind of refreshed a little bit, but I think the holes are actually in the same position. Now you can see they've drilled out some holes here. Uh, this is where the uh, turnkey in 8800B turnkey goes which I don't know what the purpose of it is. I don't know if it locks or unlocks the system or if that's what actually turns it on and off. Um, but yeah, it looks like pretty much all the original holes are there. So we should be able to take the front panel. So here's the original front panel board. And I'll just see, I'm not sure if I've got this going the right way. I think I do. I think this mounts there. Yeah, no, that, that lines up. So yeah, that's interesting, that never changed. So yeah, we're gonna have a, an extra hole here that we don't need, um, but that's not gonna matter because it'll ultimately be behind a dress panel. But yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that was exactly the thing that I was looking for. So that can go there. And the CPU card would fit 
put that there. We've got our memory card. Let's stick it there. And yeah, Bob's your uncle. And then if I put this over here, not a lot of room on this little table. This is the bottom. And I believe this goes like this. Be very careful not to scratch the paint up. There we go. And then the final touch is the cover. Ta da! Look at that. <laughs> that is starting to look like a computer. So very carefully turn it around here. So wreck the paint on the bottom. And yeah, um, I get a, a MIT serial number on the bottom here. It's not a correct one, obviously, for a Rev Zero, but it's something. Obviously, the, uh, the back panel here is not correct either, uh, the way the ports are cut out. Are totally different and I believe there were different screw holes around because there were three transformers used in the uh, in the Rev Zero but yeah I don't know yeah I think that's brilliant um, I really really appreciate Theo reaching out to me for this because uh, yeah I mean this is uh, this is like winning the lottery for me to find something like that you know, it, it's not correct uh, for a Rev Zero, but um, you know, if I have a choice between a replica part or a vintage original that came a little bit later in production than what I'm actually dealing with, I'm always gonna go for the vintage original. I mean, this is original Altair through and through right here. And yeah, it's not technically correct for a Rev Zero, but you know what? I can live with that. Um, you know, again, we're saving thousands of dollars going this route. And it's not like this isn't original MITS equipment. It is. This is all MITS Altair 8800 equipment. It's just slightly later than the Rev Zero. I mean, if I was going to try and reproduce this, I would have had a really hard time with this aluminum strip here. I, I would have had, seeing it up close, I'm, I'm now really aware of how much difficulty I would have had getting an accurate measurement. Now, now I know my friend would be capable of figuring it out. Uh, he's got a full shop full of equipment. He used to make PC chassis and then he started making uh, airport equipment like wind socks and stuff like that. I'm sure he could have figured it out and gotten it pretty darn close, but there's close and then there's the original. So that's, yeah, that's just awesome. And yeah, technically it's not correct per se for a Rev Zero. Like I said, the back panel is very different from the original. Uh, the S100 plate, uh, they didn't give you one nearly that big with the original. And obviously the power supply is not original, but it's all original MITS gear. And if I have a choice between original gear from the original manufacturer from just a, a year or two later versus uh, replica gear, I'm gonna go with the original every time. So I am so happy and thrilled uh, that Theo reached out to me on this. This is absolutely awesome. Um, it really inspires me to, to get to work on actually building this thing. Yeah, I mean, this just makes the whole process so much easier. So thank you, Theo. Thank you for reaching out to me. I really appreciate it. And definitely am going to get to work on building this thing and building up a, an operational Altair. And that brings us to our final arrival. If you've been watching this channel a while, you're probably thinking, hey, that seems familiar. Yup, you've seen this guy before, or rather it's little brother. I did a video that featured it, the Computerland Business Computer. That video turned into a full length documentary about Computerland and its Wiley founder, Bill Millard, and featured the Business Computer 88, or BC 88 as it was called, and that's the machine that Computerland hoped would turn its flagging fortunes around. The BC88 was pitched as an easily upgradable, business-oriented PC compatible. The motherboard is basically just a backplane, and the entire system resides on cards that plug into it. 
If a BC-88 owner wanted to upgrade from the 8088-2 CPU that came with their machine, all they had to do was purchase a 286 card and swap it in, and that was it. You had a 286. You could also buy the 286 version outright, which was known as the BC-286, on the hope that one day Computerland would release a 386 upgrade. So yeah, this is an actual BC-286, and I got it for dirt cheap with that Casper EGA monitor I was showing earlier. I got the computer, the monitor, keyboard, and mouse for 75 bucks. The shipping cost more than the computer did. Yeah, not turn that one down. This one seems to be stuffed with all kinds of goodies, including a 32 meg mini scribe hard drive. The original owner used it for AutoCAD, supposedly. Anyway, let's check it out. All right, so we're all set up to go here, and yeah, I'm choosing to use the Casper monitor because that's what the machine came with. And yeah, it's got that dark, splotch there. I don't think that would get in the way of doing a benchmark and uh, a quick run of uh, King's Quest or something just to, to show it off a bit. It's uh, it's just bizarre. It's, it's like a dark patch and if you whack the monitor it changes or it gets smaller. And on occasion when I've been using it uh, just with other machines I've been able to tap it gently in just such a way and it goes away and then it stays away. So I, I have no idea. I've had some people suggest it might be the shadow mask falling off or something, but I can't see how, you know, if it, if it falls off, you would think it would fall backwards like that. I can't see how tapping that would cause it to go back. It's just a very weird problem. Anyway, let's turn the computer on. Brightness cranked here. Let's just try and hit the back a little bit. And you can you can just kind of just barely see the text through there. So it's not like it's gone. It's just not got the right intensity or something. Ooh. So this machine apparently you can do the uh, system config just by hitting Control Alt Escape there, and you know pretty standard stuff. You can set the date. There is a CMOS battery, but it's uh, inside a little box that has the LEDs for the front of the case here. Just um, make that 360, because I think that's what it is. Um, I've tried various things for the hard drive. It just seems to blink there and doesn't really do anything, no matter what I do. And it's run off of an Adaptech uh, MFM controller, but it's not, I, I think the drive's just probably dead. Uh, and then we'll hit F10. It's kind of like TV sets back in the day. <laughs> I used to bang the rabbit ears trying to get the right signal. Let's just run a benchmark. I've heard rumors that these machines were crazy fast compared to their non-computer land cousins. But let's put that to the test. Ooh. Seven clock speed, nine megahertz. Okay, well that's uh, that's actually slower than my AT. I think my AT was like 10 megahertz. Yeah, that's not so impressive. FPU, video, I don't know. Yeah, you know, it's okay, 75 bucks. <laughs> Although it wasn't 75 bucks back in the day. It was bloody expensive back in the day. Throw up King's Quest here. See, as it changes uh, resolutions, it seems to get bigger or smaller. Ah, King's Quest Three in 16 colors. I don't know why, but even now, like 40 years later, 16 colors still triggers something for me. 
When I was playing this game when it was current, we had a IBM AT and it only had a four color CGA. And if you've ever tried playing four color CGA with that awful blue and orange palette, uh, <laughs> it's almost unplayable. I guess it's just because, you know, EGA was something that, I don't know if we couldn't afford it or whatever the case was, but we didn't have it. And so it's just, the fact that you don't have something kind of makes you appreciate it a little more. Or didn't have it. Now I do. Let's see? It's just totally random. You just whack it. It just gets smaller or bigger. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. But yeah, I mean, it's basically working. Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty nice system, and I would have been perfectly happy with this as a kid. I didn't get my own personal PC until 1992 or thereabouts, a 286.12 clone that had Hercules monochrome graphics initially. Yuck. I really wish I knew what was wrong with this monitor and this really bizarre dark spot. I'm just trying here again, and look, I don't get it. A couple love taps and it's gone completely. That is so bizarre. Anyway, I'm really glad to have both members of the Computerland family right here. I have heard rumors of a 3D6 variant, but I've never actually been able to find any documentary evidence of one, so I'm going to assume that doesn't exist. Anyway, you'll see these two machines in a future video where we'll do a little bit of a shootout and see how they compare to one another. And that's it for our not so mini unfridging video. Don't worry, you'll be seeing most of this gear eventually being built, restored, or whatever else is required. Anyway, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you soon.